Diving into the South China Sea dispute, several nations claim the islands, but who is the rightful landowner? Also on today's program, disorder, chaos and some hope. We analyze the state of Libya five years after the country's uprising. And in picture this, violence erupts on the streets of Kampala just days ahead of the Ugandan elections. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. It's a centuries-old dispute. Countries have wrangled over territory in the South China Seas for centuries, but in recent years, simmering tensions have been gaining heat. But why are global superpowers arguing over a collection of scarcely inhabited islands, sandbanks and rocky outcrops? China makes the largest claim to the archipelagos and has built artificial islands to cement its mark on the territory. The United States has carried out what it calls freedom of navigation missions close to the disputed area. Something China says is a threat to peace and stability. But the U.S., who is closely allied with China's rivals in the South China Seas, has called on the island dispute to be resolved peacefully and not through bullying. Today's newsmaker is the South China Sea territorial dispute as we ask why tensions in the region are rising. These tiny islands are at the heart of Asia's largest territorial dispute. Less than 100 of the 30,000 Spratly Islands are inhabited, but the surrounding waters are rich with fish, and it's thought there may be natural gas and petroleum reserves under them. China has been accused of using gunboat diplomacy to assert its claims over the islands. Rising tension has prompted a shift in America's approach, with President Barack Obama hosting the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, for the first time. The United States says it won't take sides, but it's sending a message to Beijing about bullying its neighbors. We can advance our shared vision of a regional order where international rules and norms, including freedom of navigation, are upheld and where disputes are resolved through peaceful legal means. The South China Sea includes several archipelagos, including the Spratly and Parasol Islands. China lays claim to most of it, but so do surrounding countries. Their claims conflict and overlap. China's neighbors accuse it of trying to expand its claims by building artificial islands and placing oil rigs in disputed waters. More than $5 trillion of world trade are shipped through the South China Sea each year, and the surrounding region is seeing new economic growth. U.S. companies alone have more than doubled investment here since 2008. It's why the dispute here is rattling nerves about effects on the global economy and security. ASEAN countries have been turning to Washington for support, straining already tense relations between the U.S. and China. Washington says it's safeguarding freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. New airstrips China's building on its artificial islands have concerned its neighbors about Beijing's military plans. The U.S. has already flexed its military muscle, sailing a warship down the contested strip twice in the last year. Washington's also boosted military aid to the Philippines and Vietnam. Beijing says the United States is being equally provocative and says its focus on Asia is a pretext to inflate its defense budget next year. But the Obama administration has long wanted to deepen its engagement in the Pacific, a foreign policy dubbed the Asia Pivot. But recently, Washington's had its hands full with new and old wars in the Middle East. The outgoing president will leave his successor the choice of carrying out his legacy in the South China Sea. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now to discuss whether China is acting unfairly in the South China Sea in New York is Anne Lee. She's a China relations consultant and author of the book, What the U.S. Can Learn from China. And in Paris is Francois Godmont. He's director of the Asia and China program at the European Council of Foreign Relations. Thank you both of uh, you for joining us. Anne Lee, is 
China acting unfairly in the South China Sea? Well, I would say that uh, this is very disputed, and according to China, they're not acting unfairly. Uh, China's building of uh, bases and whatnot on the islands and trying to build artificial islands is actually a response to what the other uh, nations have already done uh, in this land grab. Uh, Vietnam had done reclamation activities there before China. so. Uh, China is actually, in a way, reacting to what's happening on the ground already with uh, the other nations. And China basically has claimed that they have rights to this because this was actually granted to them after World War II uh, when Japan was defeated, and these were all Japanese-occupied territories back then. And because China and the U.S. were allies in World War II, the U.S. had wanted to uh, reward China for China's effort in contributing to the end of the war. Uh, this was documented by Elliot Roosevelt in his book, documenting his father's legacy, uh, uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, final days in the war. And this is actually uh, in the Potsdam Agreement. And so, frankly, there is a lot of history that sides with China in its claims to this area. Okay, Francois Godmont, and Lee says all of that land, all of that space that the Chinese claim, up to 80% of the South China Sea, establishing all those facts on the ground, is all legitimate. Hello? China legitimately claims all of that. What do you think? My starting point would be that even the Foreign Affairs Ministry of China does not claim that China owns the entire South China Sea. Uh, it establishes a distinction between uh, extended EZs, uh, continental shelf, uh, in other words, rights that derive from owning things that it chooses to classify as land, and ownership of the entire area. The only problem is that China will not sit down and say what belongs to it and what does not belong to it. So we are left with a kind of vague, claim, uh, and so what really matters is the boots on the ground, the facts on the sea. And on that, you have to say that ever since 1974, before the fall of the South Vietnamese regime, for example, and so way before Vietnam had any chance to militarize or even to reclaim any land in the South China Sea, China has been pushing, asserting itself uh, con almost continuously in expanding its zone of control and its practical claims. Mr. Mr. Godmon, you have China, you have Vietnam, you have the Philippines, you have Taiwan, there's even Malaysia and Brunei. Do they all have a legitimate claim? Do none of them have a claim? Or does one or more of them have a greater claim than the others on this well, land? Yeah, I understand your question. First of all, only the People's Republic, Taiwan, that is the Republic of China, which has a mirror uh, claim, and to some extent Vietnam, but even Vietnam has become ambiguous about that, only those three entities uh, have claims to roughly the entire South China Sea, with the reservations that I hinted. Others have delimitation claims, but none of the others, neither the Philippines, nor Malaysia, nor Indonesia, nor Thailand, nor Cambodia, uh, to name them, claim uh, the entirety of the zone. And of course, the PRC is the only one that is making so many efforts throughout the area to substantiate, extent the claim. Yeah, let, let's get a response from uh, Anne Lee. That was when the Philippines complained. Now, the U.S. wants the ASEAN summit to produce a statement calling for China to follow international law, to handle disputes peacefully. If they come out with that statement, as we expect them to, will China abide by it and, and you know, play this give-and-take compromise? Well, China has been trying to Are do uh, give-and-take compromise and negotiations. Basically, China had been trying to negotiate them peacefully, and there was no real uh, tension until very recently. So you have to actually wonder, ask yourself, why uh, is this suddenly a big issue if this has been dormant for decades? 
uh, this is actually probably prompted by the U.S. U.S. acting like a divorce lawyer between disputing parties and inflaming, uh, you know, both sides to to uh, raise tensions here, uh, so that the U.S. has a role to play militarily there. Otherwise, if it's too peaceful, then U.S. military has no real reason to be there, and the U.S. doesn't want to lose its influence. Uh, regarding the, uh, resolving this peacefully, so. China would be fine with uh, legal measures. It's just that it wants to make sure that the judges are actually going to be absolutely fair and impartial. Uh, if it's going to be stacked with people that are going to be uh, biased against China, then certainly uh, China would not think that this is a legitimate uh, arbitration okay. or a hearing. Uh, and furthermore, it's actually quite certain that uh, the Philippines, their lawyer actually said in November that uh, Ita Abu, which is the Taiping Island that Taiwan claims, they actually lied about it. They actually went and told The Hague and said that this was just a rock and that the uh, C Convention of the Seas does not apply to that claim that uh, Taiwan had. Well, interestingly enough, President Ma, uh, which was the Taiwan's president, back in January, went over to visit it and brought along a whole council of agriculture, council of agriculture to take real sample soils, uh, soil samples, and other uh, scientific measures to determine whether it constitutes a real natural island or just a rock. And they've all concluded that it is actually a real island okay. that it can sustain human uh, sure. okay, you, uh, you made the sustainability point. with bananas and pineapples. And so the okay. Philippines okay. have already I, lied about it. On? So you actually have to wonder why that right. this is okay. actually going okay, to be a that, fair trial. Okay, so the Philippines called it a rock and it was proven not to be a rock. Let's move on. Francois Godbon, let's talk about the United States for a second. Now, the U.S. has been in the area since World War II. Uh, you know, po immediately post-World War II, those were very different times. Right now, does the Seventh Fleet have a justifiable reason to be there? And does China have a point when U.S. destroyers pass by just 12 miles or so, uh, 12 nautical miles or so, past the disputed islands? Does China have a point that the United States really shouldn't be there? First, let me preface this by, telling, me? This, by telling you that the, the U.S. is careful enough to uh, uh, abstain from any judgment on the sovereignty issue. It doesn't want to get caught in the sovereignty quarrel. Now, on what you're saying, first, freedom of navigation is a right uh, up to the 12-mile zone. When the Chinese Navy now occasionally sends na uh, Chinese military ships off the coast of Hawaii, uh, which he has done, just to show the flag, the U.S. does not protest. But, of course, there is a more fundamental reason, which is the region's military balance and the chief role uh, that the U.S. plays throughout the region. And that's also a reason, of course, to defend freedom of navigation. So we do have a practical concern of strategic balance. And Lee, can a clash be avoided? Well, it could be if the U.S. Uh, actually stayed neutral, as they say. But as we can see, uh, the fact that they keep uh, having these meetings, secret meetings with these ASEAN nations, trying to back them up, trying to say that China can't negotiate with them, uh, and sending warships into that territory certainly is very provocative. And so it certainly dries up the tension that didn't have to be there, and it's done unnecessarily. Uh, having warships going through uh, doesn't necessarily prove freedom of navigation. Uh, this is usually for trade. And so if China, if U.S. was sending, uh, you know, cargo ships over or something, uh, had legitimate trade, then certainly there would be no issue. But sending warships is sending a very different signal. It's almost like if China sent warships off the coast of San Diego. Uh, I don't think that the U.S. is going to take that very kindly. Uh, just look at history. And so this is actually very problematic. And if the U.S. doesn't want a real clash, then they really should uh, remain neutral and stay out of it. Okay, it's going to be interesting to hear what comes out of that Sunny Lens uh, California meeting between the U.S. and ASEAN nations. We have run out of time. Anne Lee and Francois Godman, thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. Still to come on the newsmakers, can Libya heal its wounds five years after the fall of Muammar Gaddafi? 
And in picture this is Uganda able to hold a peaceful presidential election. This week marks five years since the beginning of the Libyan revolution. The country has been in chaos since the 2011 fall of longtime ruler Muammar Gaddafi. Rival governments in the east and west of the country are fighting for power, while rebel groups and militias, including Daesh, are thriving in the power vacuum. Yvette McCullough takes a look at the current situation, where there's little optimism just after a UN-backed unity government has been announced. The winds of change that swept across Tunisia and Egypt reached Libya in early 2011. Benghazi in the east was the first to rise. We will continue until even if we have to confront you with our bare hands. Yes, there is no retreat. Gaddafi, go away. We don't want you. Neither you or your family or your tribe. By the end of February, the unrest had spread to the capital, Tripoli. Muammar Gaddafi tried to use a heavy hand to crush the uprising. You are facing up to a solid rock on which the American fleets were smashed, and you think that germs like you can resist it. But a NATO bombing campaign helped revolutionary fighters advance all the way to Tripoli. And by October, the Arab world's longest serving head of state had been captured and killed. But the euphoria that followed didn't last. Libya's society split, and the fault lines are yet to heal. Militias rule over towns and villages. The UN has tried to bring together a functioning government but there are still differences among the country's many factions. Now Libya has two competing centres of power, one based in Tripoli and the other in the east. Both of them are backed by loose alliances of militias. The security vacuum has allowed Daesh to thrive in Libya. The terror group announced its presence in 2014 and has attacked oil refineries, police stations and foreign embassies, and has grabbed territory in Libya at an alarming pace. Tunisia has shut its border. It says militants who carried out the terror attacks on its soil were trained in Libya. Now the murmurs of war can be heard again. The rise of Daesh has worried NATO. It may help Libya fight the militant group if Tripoli can find a way to form an inclusive government. Since Gaddafi fell five years ago, Libya has been gripped by political deadlock and violence, and now it faces the prospect of a long war. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now to discuss the current situation in Libya is Dr. Ahmed Sawahli. He's a British Libyan psychiatrist whose family was kidnapped under Colonel Gaddafi's rule for speaking out against the dictator. Dr. Sawahli, thank you very much for joining us. Five years on, do you have any regrets whatsoever about the actual act of ousting Muammar Gaddafi, given how bad the situation is in Libya right now? Uh, absolutely not, because the Libyan revolution was something that was not actually planned. Uh, the Libyan people found themselves in a situation where, contrary to what people around the world thought, um, there was poor health care, there was a poor education system. Indeed, we see the results of this now. Uh, there was no freedom of speech whatsoever. People were being killed just for saying the wrong thing or indeed for even speaking out. And uh, Gaddafi uh, had to go. And I think enough was enough after 40 years of complete destruction of the, Lib of, of the infrastructure of a country called uh, Libya. Libya was a failed state. It still is a failed state now. Uh, but it was a failed state uh, at the time of uh, during Gaddafi's uh, rule. Now, it's almost as if there are three failed states there right now. So you've got two rival governments, and in the middle, Daesh have slipped in. They've taken over Sirte. They have upwards of 6,000 armed fighters. How do you stop them? 
Uh, well, first of all, I think uh, some of the uh, Western governments need to help Libya rather than just talk the talk. They really need to help the Libyan people. The vast majority are against uh, Daesh and, and, and any other kind of extremism in any form or, or shape. Um, they need to stop fueling this rivalry between the two governments. What we've had since the beginning is that the British, the French, the Americans, the Italians as well, don't really know what they want in Libya. They're each backing different sides, uh, and this is something which is not talked about much in the mainstream uh, media, uh, they have to actually agree uh, on, on helping the Libyan people together. I mean, in terms of Daesh, Daesh, as you said, are based in Sirte. Sirte happens to be Gaddafi's homeland, which was never known for extremism at all. But it just shows you that somebody who used to be a well-known international terrorist and his cronies and people around him, they're the ones now who are again uh, fronting this new terrorism in the form of, uh, of Daesh. Now putting the international actors aside for a second, can those politicians who represent the two rival governments, the, the Tobruk government and the Tripoli government, can those people who represent your country right now get their act together and form a unity government? Um, I have to admit, it is going to be very, very difficult. And, and uh, although we, we can put international actors aside, we can't because there's a lot of pressure, a lot of bullying on the part of some international actors uh, with various uh, groups on, on one side or the other. However, as you said, it is down to the Libyan people. The Libyan people do want a you know, a, a new uh, progressive state where Libyans can enjoy the life that they should be enjoying following the hosting of, of Gaddafi. Um, there are talks going on now, as you know, um, and even behind the scenes, there are talks between the two governments, not in the public sphere, where they're both saying, you know, guys, we need to get on with this. This is, you know, enough. No one, no, no, no one side is winning this, and let's try to, to get, do something for the Libyan people. Um, there are difficulties. I would say that the main difficulty at the moment is one person, uh, namely Khalifa Haftar, uh, who is the uh, general on the east side of the country, who I have to say has even threatened his own Tobruk parliament that if they do not take the decisions that he wants, they themselves uh, may, be, may be killed. So why does he have so much power? Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, he's. I mean, when he first came to Libya following uh, 25 years of exile in, in America, he was laughed at by a lot of Libyan people, indeed, in, uh, you know, around the world as well. You'll see many uh, articles by American papers saying, you know, what is this guy doing now in Libya? Is he backed by the CIA, not backed by the CIA? He's definitely backed by the Egyptian government. And I think that's where the problem is. I mean, the Egyptian government, which, as we all know, is, is a dictatorship in itself, is now wanting to take part in seeing whether Libya has democracy or not. I mean, I found that quite, uh, quite strange. Unfortunately, though, um, the Western powers have not mentioned Khalifa's Haftar's name in public. They are definitely doing so in private and in all the meetings that are being held uh, about Libya, but they're not talking about him in public. I mean, this guy has bombed every single city in Libya, and he wants to be a new Gaddafi. And the Libyan people are not going to have that, not after all the lives lost, not after the way Libya has been destroyed by this internal fighting. We are not going to have a new Gaddafi. Dr. Ahmed Sohali, thank you very much for joining us. In today's picture, this violence has erupted in Uganda just days before the country is expected to vote in a presidential election. At least one person has been killed in fighting between police and opposition supporters. Let's take a look.
Today's newsmaker has been the ongoing dispute in the South China Sea. U.S. President Barack Obama is hosting a special summit with leaders from Southeast Asia as he looks to present the U.S. as a significant player in the Pacific. He wants to provide a united front with his Pacific allies over disputes with Beijing. Both China and the U.S. accuse each other of destabilizing and provocative actions in the South China Sea. While the unassuming islands may not look like much, the waterway carries an estimated $5 trillion in trade every year and likely harbors lucrative natural resources. And that means this tense territorial dispute is unlikely to enter calmer waters anytime soon. You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. As always, thank you for watching. See you soon. Bye.